Good morning. Good morning, Timeless Investors. Thank you for being here. We're going to do a little bit of a different format for today's video. I just released a premium article on Substack for our paid users, and I want to kind of walk through some of the analyses we did there because I think it's incredibly pertinent to what we are dealing with today. So the premise of the piece is this. Everybody assumes interest rates drive cap rates, right? That like there's a difference between the interest rate you can get paid for a risk-free investment. It's a very fundamental to finance, right? There's an interest rate you can get paid risk-free, theoretically risk-free through government bonds and everything else needs to kind of go off of that. That is the fundamental framework of investing. If you can get risk-free returns, why would you take a lower return for something else? And so therefore capitalization rates for real assets and real estate should predictably follow the treasury yields. But it isn't that way. It doesn't actually work that way. And the premise of the article is thus. In rising rate environments, we assume that assets, real estate assets lose value because cap rates increase just like a bond, yield increases and the value drops, right? So, but if you look at history, it's actually not the case. And the article will show that pretty demonstratively, but I want to walk you guys through a little presentation I prepared for our YouTube channel for the Timeless Investor Network here to kind of walk through some of the math and the analysis behind this, just to give you some ideas of the many different factors that actually influence capitalization rates and real estate returns. And it's especially pertinent right now because Jerome Powell just dropped the Fed funds rate again. And theoretically, everything else anchors off the Fed funds rate. Again, this is back to like finance theory 101, right? The shortest term debt is the least risky for a variety of reasons. And so if that rate drops, then everything else should sort of follow it down. Whether it works out like that is a completely different question. And we'll kind of dive into that. But one of the things that I'm hearing a lot in real estate circles, and you know, I, I would love to believe this myself too, is that the Fed cutting rates is going to magically save real estate, right? Nothing can save real estate. Real estate is fine. It has some very specific use cases. Rates dropping will add some marginal benefit for people that have difficult refinances coming up. Marginal, not huge, right? We're not going to get back, in my opinion, I don't think we'll, in our lifetime, but I don't know, we'll see. I don't think in our lifetime we'll see the 10-year treasury below 1% again, right? Which what's happened between 2020 and 2023 which drove a lot of the bubble pricing we've seen. And we'll get to that on a regional slide as well, just to share with you guys. Let me start with this first slide. These are the factors that influence capitalization rates. This is from CBRE Econometric Advisors. I thought this was fascinating because what everybody assumes is that this capital market conditions is the biggest driver of cap rates, right? But CBRE has actually done this analysis, which I thought was fascinating. And we don't go into all of this in the report, but it's really interesting. All the different things that have a positive or negative impact on capitalization rates. So plus being something that would drive cap rates higher, which would drop value, right? Negative being it would reduce cap rates and drive values higher, right? So you have this inverse relationship, higher cap rates, lower value, right? And look at all the different things that play into what drives capitalization rates. And notice that capital market conditions, the nominal treasury yield, is just one of many factors that actually influences cap rates for real estate. And there's a long history, and we will go through one or two of these examples, that rising rates or falling rates don't necessarily tell you what the market thinks it's going to say or what real estate practitioners writ large and many, many people in this business ascribe to and have some relatively simplistic thinking about like, how does this actually work, right? So these are the things that drive it. Look at the sensitivity of cap rates to these macro factors. The treasury, and I'm going to look at multifamily specifically because I run a multifamily investment company, Lombard Equities Group. So it's important. And obviously, all these other factors are relevant too. But look at this. The multifamily has not a one-for-one -one correlation with treasury yields for its cap rates. Yes, there is a strong correlation between the two, as you would expect, right? If you can get a 10% yield on a treasury bond, why would you buy, theoretically, and I'm going to get into this, why would you buy a 5% cap rate real estate investment? 
in in the simplest simplistic economics and finance theory, you wouldn't because you can get a higher risk for yield. It's not 100% true, but there's some aspects to that. Now look at these other factors. They also have an impact on cap rates. So cap rates are not just driven by treasury yields. Should be obvious, but I just want to really hammer that point home. What is important is the cap rate spread. So this is a fantastic report I discovered from Crow Holdings, which is a great group. I didn't even know about them. Just quick side note, if you're ever doing research for an article and you're reading other articles to get understanding to drive your article, click the citation links. There is some amazing data out there that they are just sharing out there in the citations. And if you click into the citation, you can see the source that they pulled that data from. And sometimes you find these incredible things. Holdings came from that, right? I found the Crow Holdings reports through someone else's report, and I found this incredible report. So look at this. This is the 10-year treasury yield, okay? This is the cap rate here, and this is the cap rate less the treasury yield. This is the cap rate spread. Cap rate spread is what we've been describing, the spread between capitalization rates and the 10-year treasury, or actually reverse that, the spread between the 10-year treasury and capitalization rates. So you can see in the early 80s with the Volcker Fed, we actually had a negative cap rate spread, which is totally counterintuitive and not what you would expect from this dramatic rise in the 10-year treasury yield. Theoretically, if you ascribe to the notion that cap rates just blindly follow treasury yields, then this should have been up here, but it didn't. Why? Because there's a lot of other factors that drive capitalization yields, not just the 10-year treasury rate. But the cap rate spread is important. It is relevant. So you'll notice here that we had in, so right before the 2008, you'll notice cap rate spreads got incredibly low, like really low. Makes sense, right? Treasury yields were rising, but look at the capitalization rate. There is like no spread between the two. So you could argue right here is one of the riskiest times to be an investor. And guess what? That was accurate because right here we have the GFC. And spreads shot up as they should because other factors that go into real estate valuations are things as simple as what does the risk environment look like? Are risk spreads widening? What's happening with credit spreads? What's happening with the real economy? There's a lot of factors that go into this. And you'll notice here, this report kind of ends at 2021. However, this is also interesting because the 10 year after this point dropped really, really low and actually spreads were pretty good because this didn't follow this down to the ground. And that was a big argument when they started to, the first kind of Fed rate increases started kicking into effect. A lot of people were saying, well, you know, the spread is still pretty good, but again, it's not a one-for-one -one relationship. And that's really, really important to understand, especially right now as rates are dropping, because what does that mean? I thought this was a fascinating insight as well. So that I want to talk about this extensively. So there is a high correlation between inflation and real estate returns. So let's talk about a particular period in history that is fascinating. And this chart doesn't show it, but I want to describe it to you guys. In the 1970s, we had stagflation. We had really high inflation. And what the findings of my research have discovered is that cap rates are more focused on real yields, not nominal yields. Meaning if inflation is high, higher than the 10-year treasury rate, for example, or even slightly higher or the same, your real yield is zero or negative. And so what's really interesting is that in the early 80s, to go back to this point, this was, this was looking at a real yield basis, right? So this cap rate spread to the treasury was not relevant. The cap rate spread to the real yield of the 10-year treasury rule was what is important. And so the 70s and the early 80s is a really interesting case study in this because real estate didn't perform as you would expect it to in this environment, right? It didn't do what you would think. You would think with skyrocketing interest rates that real estate would underperform, but actually the data showed that real estate was returning about a 5.7% annualized growth rate 
over that period. Why? Because rents were rising at pace with inflation, which is why, which is why with higher inflation regimes, real estate tends to perform really well. Now, I want to talk about this because I find this fascinating. And any long-term followers of me will know, I love to hate on the Sun Belt, okay? It's, it's one of my favorite things to do. Look at what happened. Everybody knows the Sun Belt got really, really, really hot. Now, look, the, the yield that these folks, this is a report from TIAA Cref or TA something. You'll notice this, that the cap rates in the West never really got out of control. This number, by the way, is a broad regional indicator in specific subset markets of the Sun Belt, like Austin, some parts of Florida, some parts of, I mean, I heard people talking about Franklin, Tennessee, Huntsville, Alabama, different Sun Belt markets. This got way lower. Okay. So there was a dramatic drop and then a spike back up. And the reality is the cap rate spread, while it's really important, is a national figure. Meaning when we quote 300 as the typical spread, and I've heard all kinds of numbers. I've even heard 150 before. So 300, 150, something in that range, right? That is a national spread. Western markets and some parts of the Northeast, like Manhattan, for example, typically trade at a better cap rate spread than other markets. So what's interesting about this last little, I think, bubble we went through in the Sun Belt is cap rate spreads in the Sun Belt got thinner than they were on the West Coast and the East Coast. Now, why? There's many factors behind that. Demand, tons of money was flowing into those markets. Population growth, projected rent growth. All of those factors, as you'll recall from higher up on the presentation, have a positive, negative, but positive effect on cap rates. It drives them down and increases the value. However, they all proved illusory, right? Population growth slowed down supply dramatically increased, interest rates increased, all these factors conspired together to cause this big rebound back up. And this is data as of 2023, by the way, this number is probably worse now for the Sun Belt in particular. This number, in most of the markets we look at, we are seeing deals priced in the mid to high five caps. So this rings true. We are finding deals, seven plus cap rate deals, but we are looking at a particular style of building an investment opportunity that not everybody is willing to look at in these markets, which is why we are finding these seven plus percent cap rate deals. The point being regional variation also matters tremendously in this analysis. Now I wanna show you this last slide as kind of a, a closer on this thing. So I realize that we are not technically in a rising interest rate environment, but we will see what happens because one of the things that came out of the Fed speech two days, I think two days ago, two days ago, is that inflation expectations are rising, right? So the economy is not doing well, but rates may actually continue to rise. But the other important thing is this, inflation expectations rising means the real yield on treasuries is dropping, which is bullish for real estate. On the flip side, falling rate environments, and this is kind of the kicker to the whole piece, falling rate environments are not this, I don't know how you say this, panacea for real estate valuations. Why? Because dropping interest rates is a defensive maneuver in reaction to a deteriorating underlying economic condition. So the Fed, and I'm not going to get into whether it's political influence or what, the Fed is dropping rates because the economy is not performing well. And I can tell you anecdotally across our portfolio, we're seeing rising delinquency, more difficulty leasing units. So the real question is, why would falling rates help real estate? And the answer is, it doesn't, not really. It either creates a bubble or it helps in some marginal refinance scenarios, like I mentioned before. But rising rates are generally indicative of higher inflation, which is positive for cap rates in real estate, and a strengthening economy. So falling rates don't necessarily mean cap rates follow them and tandem them down. Rising rates do not necessarily mean that cap rates just rise unilaterally. The point is life and investing are complex and multivariate. We in this industry would love to argue that, you know, things are really black and white and binary. Falling rates, you know, dropping cap rates, values increase. It is never that simple. And I want to leave you with that. It is never that simple. Please check out 
the article that I will link in the show notes here or the, the YouTube notes here. Let me know what you think. Drop a comment. Tell me what you're seeing out there in your markets, what you've learned, what you found valuable in this report. And I want to leave you with think well, act wisely, build something timeless. Thank you for being part of the Timeless Investor community. I'll see you next time.